Hello and welcome into the Cubs on Deck podcast. I am one of your hosts. My name is Greg Huss. And today I am joined by the other Greg. I'm joined by Greg Zumak. Dude, we got actual minor league baseball happening. It's arrived. We're here. It's time. I still don't believe it. I mean, like, we finally, we finally have baseball back. It, this past week has been kind of a blur. Part of that is just I'm back in the classroom. I'm doing stuff at work, which is great. But, you know, I was wrapping some stuff up today and then was, like, getting a bunch of messages as soon as I picked up my phone and was like, are you watching Imanaga? It's like, no, I'm good. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Um, it's just baseball's back, man. It, it's crazy to be back and, and watching all these games. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's weird. We're, honestly, this is kind of a weird episode. We're recording yeah. uh, today on on Monday the first. Um, the Iowa Cubs are back in action starting tomorrow on Tuesday. We saw uh, a few games this weekend from the Iowa Cubs. Obviously, they uh, they played three games this weekend. This is kind of a weird episode. It's kind of an in between where we have three games of of uh, of Iowa Cubs games to cover. The rest of the affiliates are not in action yet. They will be in action later this week. And so, like next week's episode will be kind of more jam-packed with more prospects in action uh but this is kind of fun because we can talk about the guys that are at the upper levels of the minors we're going to talk about uh ben brown's prom- promotion today we'll talk about uh owen casey's hot start in iowa we'll talk about matt mervis kind of hitting the ball uh really hard <laughs> really really hard at iowa so far uh jordan wicks is still technically a prospect so we'll talk about him a little bit um we've got some michael arias news it sounds like so there's, there's a lot of stuff of guys already on the 40-man roster uh, guys that that are in the upper levels that we'll talk about today. Um, we also sent out on Twitter for some listener questions, so we can address a couple of those today. Um, and then we've got you, Zumac, on the show, which means we got to talk some draft talk. Um, you released a mock draft uh, what last week, so we'll get dig into that a little bit. So we're still making this a jam-packed show, even though there's less kind of things specifically to, to cover. Um, but let's let's go ahead and kick it off with Ben Brown because that was kind of the big that was the biggest news of the week this past week was. Uh, Ben Brown being assigned to Iowa to start off the year. He was released as a part of that big announcement that uh, of the opening day roster for the Iowa Cubs and then was called up to Chicago uh, before he could even probably suit up in an Iowa Cubs uniform. He was called up to Chicago and made his his MLB debut that did not go pretty. But how cool was it that, that Ben Brown quickly got that promotion? Yeah, I mean, I think before the guy even got a chance to get any Fong's pizza in, in Des Moines, like he he was already up. Um, and it's it, it's kind of a mixed bag. I, I was very happy. I was very impressed, actually, what I saw. It, if you showed me just the individual, like, pitch-by-pitch pitch outing and then showed me the line, I would not have believed it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's just the nature of baseball, right? Like, it's not that big a deal, but it's also why you can't instantly pencil in these guys with incredible talent to provide production because the adjustment to the major leagues is pretty crazy. Baseball is weird. You know, maybe one of those balls that's hard hit right at a defender gets picked up and it's a completely different outing. Um, But, you know, it's just the nature of it. I, I was still impressed to see a the urgency upon which they called him up, right? Like this is not a knock to anybody. They're an insult, but like they could have called up Thomas Mm Pannone and had him just eat up some innings, but instead they called up Ben Brown. Uh, And then I liked the stuff that I saw. Yeah. I'm curious to see how the Cubs end up using him um, Mm -hmm. in Chicago. Obviously I think that we saw that we saw them use him um, as a multi-inning reliever um, in his debut and it seems like that might be the route they continue to go with Drew Smiley, maybe in the rotation. But um, I, I'm, and I think that as we talked over the offseason, I think that this was a, a topic that, that got brought up quite a bit over the offseason was Ben Brown being used as a Justin Steele of 2021, right? That was 2021 yeah. when Justin Steele came up. He was a reliever. He was converted back to being a starter. Uh, that was kind of, I, I think that's how we kind of telegraphed this whole situation playing out for Ben Brown. Mm-hmm. I think we kind of expected it to happen later in the year, probably mid summer rather than uh, yeah. before April even hits. Uh, but I think that he made a pretty strong impression in spring training this year, um, obviously to the point where he was called up in, in March. Right. So um, yeah. now it's just a matter of, will he be used as a reliever? He stretched out as a starter. He's, he's ready to go as a starter. Um it probably depends a little bit on, on Jameson Tyon. It probably depends on Justin Steele on how quickly 
Obviously, they said that Steele was out the entire month of April, but we saw him. We saw clips of Justin Steele down on the field throwing before the game, before the the home opener for the Cubs uh, today on on Monday. So I don't know. I'm curious to see how they end up using him, how he responds to his usage, um, and how he ultimately responds to being sent back down to Iowa. Because I, I think that that probably will happen. I mean, unless he absolutely tears it up, right? If he can, if he continues to from this point on kill it at the major league level then that's a different story. But I think the expectation is he probably will go back down to Iowa at some point when we see some healthier starting pitchers for the Cubs. How does he respond to that reassignment, you know? It's it's a great question. I mean, right now they're down two starters, right? They're down Steele, and then they're down Tyone. And they already have Javier Assad in the rotation. Mm -hmm. And he's proven that he's been able to get major league innings out and and has had some success. So, like, it's not like that's impossible that he continues to do it but yeah i mean i guess it's also possible that brown just totally tears stuff up and then proves that when tyone is back and whatever and steel is back that maybe he at least deserves another shot um the interesting thing that i'll be very interested to see yeah what they do basically with his usage but what they do this upcoming wednesday because that's kind of the day that we penciled in, they need a starter. Mm-hmm. If that game gets played, the thing I was wondering with his debut is, did they kind of set it up on a day that he would normally be piggybacking, or or um or set it up as like a bullpen, yeah. uh, you know, session day? I don't know. I think we'll find out Wednesday, but it, it was at least fun to see. We also might not find out Wednesday because it might snow. They might the game might get snowed out. So yeah, it looks awful. <laughs> who's the same? But no, I, I just think that, that that's worth pointing out, and I think that this is kind of the theme of this episode is talking about guys that um, have already made the major leagues um, to a certain degree. But we're they're still prospects, so we'll still talk about them. Uh, let's transition that into Jordan Wicks. Let's stay on the mound. Yep. Uh, let's talk Jordan Wicks because um, he threw for the Chicago Cubs on that was on Sunday. Um, against the Rangers, against the defending champion Rangers, right? Do I have the date right on that one? Yeah. 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 Um, and so. he looked really Sunday. good. I think the results were were kind of middling, but the 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 process and the way in which he went about doing it was really strong. I think that what stood out to me the most, and I'll kick it to you here on your thoughts, but the thing that stood out to me the most with Jordan Wicks were the whiffs. Um, generated 19 whiffs on 85 pitches. Uh, all six strikeouts were on fastballs, all six of them, which is kind of crazy. Uh, that like that stood out to me like that was a glaring thing that stood out it was like he got whiffs which getting that amount of whiffs and the fastball working in that degree that is exactly what kind of bumps Jordan Wicks up from a bottom of the rotation starter to a mm-hmm. middle of the rotation starter you know yeah I mean like you know there's a quick little tangential kind of discussion about whether it was an incredible outing kind of like Brett Taylor mentioned. And, and, you know, whatever. I don't think we need to parse things out as much. The whole point is that exactly what you said, right? Like, it is the fact that Jordan Wicks went up against a playoff caliber team. And in many ways, it felt like a playoff caliber game. And no, of course, it's game three of 162, and so it's not a playoff game. But it felt like a playoff caliber game. And that's the kind of outing that you would imagine to see in a playoff start is that you you pretty much you give it your all and you just kind of grit through as many innings as you can keep the guy keep the other team off the board as best you can yeah there were base runners yeah whatever he went about it in a completely different way with his fastball the fastball had got a lot of induced vertical break i think steven uh was out there steven pappas calculated and it was like an induced vertical break of about 18 and a half which is decidedly well above average if that's great carry and the other thing is that it came from a fairly low release which is a little bit different than what he's done before not that he was like super over the top but it was definitely a little bit lower than normal and so in many ways it's kind of funny because imanaga pitched today but it's very similar profile to imanaga this high carry fastball at the top of the zone and while it's slightly different a changeup versus a splitter they're pretty similar in profile and and so like all of a sudden the cubs have kind of you know got a couple <laughs> guys there that they can deploy in these in these ways it was really impressive what we saw from jordan wicks 
Yeah, I and that's all we really need to see from Jordan Wicks yeah. are like these very like in, incremental changes, these incremental improvements um, that just <clears throat> kind of bump them up a notch. And and I don't want to be dramatic, obviously, but like a for game three of a season, that's about as playoffy as it possibly gets for game three of a major league baseball season, right? Where you got you're facing the defending like world champs, you're down 0-2 in that in that series, yep. you're on the road, like. It, in the grand scheme of things, like it, it's not it's not a super important game, but like that's as close as it gets in game this early in the season. And so, and and I don't have a doubt in my mind that Jordan Wicks is one of those guys that can go out into any playoff atmosphere, and the heart rate doesn't change. Um, he just goes out there, and and maybe if anything, it slows down, and he gets a little bit more, uh, a little more, bit more out of what he what he can do. So, uh, yeah, I was just, I was very 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 impressed with Jordan Wicks uh, yesterday on Sunday. Um, and I, yep. I'm, I'm just excited to see him lose prospect status pretty soon as he continues to rack up innings in Chicago. Yeah. And I mean, not, not to make too much this, but right. Like we just talked about the Cubs having a starting rotation issue right now, right? Mm-hmm. Like with both steel and Tyone out and Hendricks didn't really look good the day before. I think he writes the ship and that's fine. But you also at the time didn't know what Imanaga was going to give you clearly today. It was stellar, but you didn't know. And so if Wicks raises a lot of questions because he just doesn't look like he, you know, has anything but that change up, which has never really been the thing. But, you know, if, if hitters are just completely spitting on that change up and he doesn't have anything else, all of a sudden the Cubs are having to get really, really creative with their usage. It didn't look like that. He's made mm-hmm. some development steps and I'm excited to see what it looks like. I would love to for the Chicago Cubs to have a, a return of Justin Steele healthy mm-hmm. and have a, a big three of him, Imanaga, yeah. and Jordan Wicks up top of the rotation. That'd be that'd be, fun, that'd be terrific. That'd be amazing. So yep. um let's transition into some some hitters that are in triple A. So we <laughs> we've we covered the major league team already, but we did see Iowa Cubs action. We saw Iowa Cubs action. That, honestly, it was, <laughs> dude, it was great. It was awesome. It was like, I got to throw the the game on TV. It was mm-hmm. obviously an away game. So I threw uh, Alex Cohen on the radio. I synced up the feed between Alex Cohen on the radio and the, the video feed on, on MLB um, on the MLB app, which was ter- honestly, dude, how, how great is it that the, the MLB app finally. has minor league baseball now? Like yeah. that has been a lifesaver. Like finally, I, I just, it, cause it came last year, but like it was, it was, it was, it was a little weird last year, it, but the fact that they had it and like, yeah. Oh man, dude. Like when, when it was only available on computer and phone, it was such a pain in the butt. And now it's like, now we can watch on the app on TV. It's, I love it. Yeah. I mean, it's just nice to have that option, right? Like there's no reason that a $10 billion a year industry can't figure that out. Yeah. And I know it's just like the lowest priority situation, but they finally took care of it. And frankly, like I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent, but like minor league baseball is the type of baseball that I bring my family to. That's the yep. type of baseball that they resonate with. Like my kids, Teddy bears is sluggo from the Emeralds games. Like, that's how they learn about the game of baseball and to be able to broadcast that better is is very important for growing the game so kudos to mlb and milb and now you can turn on some games yeah exactly so we did this weekend we got to Mm -hmm. watch the iowa cubs in action against uh, the omaha storm chasers um, we got to start off with Owen Casey. We have to. Looks amazing. Uh, what Owen Casey did, I mean, he he is now, through three games, he is seven for his first 12 at the plates. Um, and it feels higher. And it feels higher. Um, he is hitting the ball hard. He is also getting uh, little jam shots and bloops to land as well. And part of that, I, I want to emphasize, that I, I think that a lot of times with, with players, you look at a guy who – like Owen Casey, you said, ah, oh, he had three jam shots that kind of landed over the infielders' heads. Yeah, but he's also really strong, and a normal mm-hmm. player wouldn't have got it over the over the infielders' heads at all. So um, Owen Casey just looked really impressive. It was just carrying over his strong start from spring training. Um, I, it's going to take more than a three-game sample size for me to say, oh, you know, call him up right now. I think people are. People are right now. They're saying, yeah. call up Owen Casey to, to Chicago this very second. We're not ready for that. That's not happening yet, obviously. We're going to need to see several weeks of this, not a few days. But, I mean, how awesome was it to see what Owen did in Iowa this weekend? I mean, it's exactly what you want to see. I mean, we talked about this in the winter, that we wanted to see Owen Casey facing off against, like, 
32 year old lefties who can dot a change up on the outside corner and just, I mean, I don't want to say like junk balling pitchers, but guys that are going to throw the kitchen sink at players at hitters. We want to see that. And so that's what I'm still waiting on, but you're already seeing him face off against like advanced arms. Mm -hmm. And that is so important. I, I still can't remember, can't believe that he's as young as he is doing this in triple a and so yes it's three games and no he's not ready for the majors and but you know what let's just appreciate what he's doing right now because it was very awesome to see um not i mean unrelated to the to the hot hitting start he did play some left field he he played some Mm -hmm. right and some left field which i know people are like oh let's play some first base that's not happening yet um yeah not yet but i think it's good i think it's good that he was playing some left field that's i mean it's a different it's a different look Mm -hmm. Um, it's not something that he saw the past few years of his career. He was strictly a right fielder and a DH. So to get him some action in left field is always good. And Iowa, the triple A level, that's when you start to see the, the, the maneuvering of positions a little bit more as they prepare for, I mean, what if it is left field, right? What if, what if Ian Happ goes down with an injury and Owen Casey's playing left field in in Chicago? You know, I think that's important to, to just get to get familiarize yourself with that, that environment out there. Yeah. Cause I mean, right now, you know, not to get too Chicago meta, but like Mike Talkman looks pretty good and he's kind of playing this DH left fielder type role, probably not too much center field, but he can, you know, in a pinch. And he's that kind of like fourth outfielder. If there comes a time in the season though, that like exactly like what you say, right? You know, Ian tweaks an oblique or does whatever, you know, has to go down for a couple weeks. You want to have the options available to you. And frankly, that may be Casey's role in 20 late 2024 early 2025 this like he's going to play 50 games in left field 50 games in right field 50 games at first base or you know and dh mixed in there or whatever and give everybody a spell and like you want to be able to work out some of those kinks in the minor leagues so triple a is a great time to be able to do that yeah i i mean since we're kind of a little bit more focused on the major league product in mm-hmm. comparison to some of these players today well, i i want to i want to pump the breaks on the excitement over like, let's get Ian Happ the heck out of left field oh. and put Owen Casey. I don't, I don't get, I don't, I don't get that at I'm all. I'm not even man. like saying that just because Owen care because uh, Ian Happ went four for five with the game winning walk the other day. Like I'm not even saying could just get Ian Happ is a good baseball. I, I've seen people yeah. say, let's move, move <clears throat> Ian Happ to third base. I, I've seen all these different things. It just, <laughs> oh it, it does not, it does not make any sense to me, dude. I, I don't, I don't get it. So yeah. I, I guess my point with, with this is that get excited about Owen Casey, right? We, mm-hmm. we should be excited about what he's doing. Him being that young and performing well in AAA is remarkable. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is a remarkable thing that he's doing. Also, we can appreciate what Ian Happ has done consistently over the past few years and will probably consistently do for the next <clears throat> couple of years, right? Yeah. We can appreciate that as well. Owen Casey will be up when he's ready to be up. There's no because of the outfield depth, because of Seiya, Ian, and Cody Bellinger, mm-hmm. and PCA, because of that group, and, yep. and Mike Talkman and whoever else, because yep. of that grouping of outfielders, there is no need to rush Owen Casey. Now, if Owen Casey is ready to roll, that upside that he has, I know that that I listen to the CHGO po- podcast with Brendan Miller and Corey Friedman, and Brendan always hits home the idea of the Cubs don't have a whole lot of guys that are like that high upside, like potential outcomes. The the Christopher yeah. Morrell is that guy. Nick Madrigal is not that guy, right? That's an example of that. Um, Owen Casey is that guy. He does mm-hmm. have that like really high upside, not in terms of like his career path, but just in terms of like the results, the results over the, over the course of one season this season. Um, so like you'd rather see Owen Casey than Mike Talkman potentially, but like he won't be called up until he is ready. And then once he's ready, yeah, go ahead and slot him in in right field and left field and DH yeah. wherever you want in Chicago. But the Cubs have the ability to be very patient with him. And if it's this year, awesome. If it's next year, great. Dude, if, if he's not even up till the year after, it's like he's still only going to be 23 years old. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's really crazy. Yeah, I want him to just get a whole bunch of time and force his way up here. Yes. Um, but yeah, the, I, not to get too far into it, I haven't understood the hap discourse. Like yeah. it finding major league hitters who can be eighteen to twenty percent better than the average hitter isn't exactly easy. So like, 
let's let Owen force the issue when he's ready. The whole mm-hmm. point is there's going to be plenty of at-bats. The DH exists. Thank goodness. Let's let Owen Casey just force his way up here. I'm hoping it's later this summer. I think it's possible. Yeah. Anything else you want to hit on with, with Owen before we move on to the next big slugger? No, I think that just I, I want to say that his approach has looked continued from spring training looking really good. It's not like he's not mashing middle, middle fastballs yeah. and like, hey, that'd be good if he did that. But he he's actually take, taking a pretty good approach. at the plate. All this and he still has yet to homer in his three, mm-hmm. three games went by and Owen Casey didn't homer. What is going on? Um, so <laughs> we'll go crazy. With that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other guy hitting the ball really hard. Um, down in Iowa this weekend was Matt Mervis. Uh, yeah. this, this Sunday alone, I, I, I need to go back and look at the previous two days, but just Sunday alone, he had four hard hit balls. That's that's baseball's hit over 95 miles an hour um, exit velocity. Um, he's hitting the ball really, really hard as Matt Mervis. Mm-hmm. And I think that prospect fatigue comes in a lot of different forms, whether it's a guy who is signed super young, who's been in the organization for a long time. It's a guy who dealt with injuries and he's coming back. If it's uh, a guy who performed really well at the lower minor, whatever it might be, it comes in a lot of different forms. Matt Mervis has some prospect fatigue, but the dude can still hit AAA like nobody's business. And he hasn't really proven that he can't hit the major league level, but like he's just hitting the ball very hard. I know we talked about on our Iowa Cubs preview, I guess it was last week, right? It was last week with me and Brian, yeah, and, Brian and Alex. Mm-hmm. Um, Alex talked about that like he's looking out for Matt Mervis to be able to hit lefties and he's looking for him to be able to, to cut down on the swing and miss. And this weekend he did that to a certain degree and he hit, he definitely hit some lefties. Uh, I think he had a double off of a lefty um, and some of those hard hit balls were off lefties. So a lot to like for Matt Mervis this year. And that's all you can really ask for him, uh, ask from him down in, down in AAA Iowa. Yeah. I mean, you never know when you're going to need to get called up and you know, what does his path look like? I don't think any of us have an idea. I don't think the Cubs have an idea. But it, if you can hit, you are going to find eventual major league playing time. And so, you know, it's possible that he comes up for two weeks because of an injury. Obviously, hopefully not. But it's possible he just forces his way up because he's mashing, and which makes sense. Um, and then you just slot him in a DH for a few, you know, for a few weeks. It's just hit, 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 and we'll figure it out. What are your thoughts on? So like, God forbid, like Michael Bush mm-hmm. goes down with an injury, right? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not obviously, I mean, I, I want, I want Michael Bush to absolutely mash up there and right. him to run away with the first base job. That'd be great. Say, say Michael Bush theoretically goes down with an injury. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of viewing Matt Mervis in a competition with Alexander Canario for a call up, right? So like you can go one of yeah. two different directions, right? If, if, if Bush is out, you can call up Matt Mervis and there, there's, there's a first baseman that kind of slots in and, and shares mm-hmm. the time. Makes sense. This is kind of excluding a, a Patrick Wisdom scenario and all this. That's weird. Right. Um, the other scenario is you call up Alexander Canario to play the outfield and then move Cody Bellinger to first base. So, like, in a lot of ways, I think that Matt Mervis and, and Alexander Canario are kind of competing with each other to, to receive a potential call up. Um, now, that's a very specific situation. But, like, right. I guess my point is that Matt Mervis is competing with a lot of other individuals to get a call up to Chicago. All the while, he's competing to to win a job on a different team as well. That's that's mm-hmm. that's the that's how minor league baseball works. Is you're trying out not only for your team but for every other all twenty nine other other organizations. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's crazy that we see Canario and Mervis up at some yeah. point this year prior to the trade deadline, and not necessarily to specifically chop them, but also like to at least kind of give you know some pretty good views on, on these guys, but mm-hmm. also to kind of figure out what you have, right? Like you might get him up there and now either one of them has settled in after they've got their first time up in the major jitters out and they're just crushing it. Then at that point, you know exactly what you have in them and you ride with it and yeah. just, you find the plate appearances. It'll be very interesting, but I, I think kind of baseball has this, you know, it works out. And so I think at some point we see those guys up in the majors. Um, all right, man, we got one more player we wanted to talk about specifically today. Um, and this is from a report from Arizona Phil <clears> that, <throat> that it looks like that Michael Arias, who was a starting pitcher last year, was a shortstop however many years ago, um, yeah. and was added to the 40 man roster this past off season. Um, the report from Arizona Phil is that Michael Arias will be working as a reliever 
as a like a single inning high leverage reliever um, down in double A uh, to start off the season. So let's go under the assumption that report is true, which we have no yeah. reason to believe it's not. Um, what's your take on the conversion to start the year <clears throat> into relieving for Arias? You know, it's interesting because I thought they would do what they did with Daniel Palencia last year, which is to let him start for a little bit kind of build up some innings try to figure out you know what you got maybe work on that third pitch you know whatever and then at some point transition to the pen cubs are playing with some more urgency it's really interesting and so last year i kind of asked a little bit about because we heard from you know good friend of the podcast and an and excellent writer and prospect analyzer evaluator um, Matt Thompson from Prospects Live, he's dropped on the Discord at times that Prospects Live gotten some feedback that, you know, certain teams have Michael Arias as like a 60. So basically like a plus level pitcher. And that's some big feedback. And Prospects Live is super cued in on these things. They're talking to people, they're here and stuff. So that's pretty impressive. And so I asked a couple pro scouts and one of them responded back with that they think he's a future closer. And so sometimes like when you ask about certain players, um, you'll hear like, yeah, I think he could be like a high leverage pen arm or he could, he could be really good in the pen or whatever. There's whether it matches up with analysts or data or whatever, there's something about saying somebody is a closer that kind of really resonates with me. And I don't know if the intention is there, but it's not just, boy, I think that guy could be awesome in the pen, but like, closer that guy is a lockdown closer he didn't, he didn't have lockdown. to say closer he could have said he high, lever, high leverage have, yeah like i think he'd be good in the pen yeah. and it, it just it, there's just something that just resonated with me and so i think we got a chance to see it this year and he's on the 40 man so like shoot sky's the limit yeah i it's that report is just super interesting to me it's, uh, it's still wild i know so <laughs> i i posted on the 1060 west discord channel that i thought it was really interesting that We've seen the Cubs kind of go this route. The past, like I guess last year was a big year for this, where yep. um, Daniel Palencia and Luke Little specifically. Porter Hodge, so Porter Hodge was also converted to the bullpen. But let's focus on Palencia and Little, right? Where yep. they entered the season as starting pitchers. We we had a really good feeling with both of those guys that they would ultimately be relievers. I, I'd say that that Luke Little probably more so. I, we were probably at about ninety percent on Luke Little yeah. being a being a reliever. We were probably about eighty percent or more than that on Daniel Palencia. Right? It was we just kind of expected the conversion to relief was mm -hmm. going to happen with both of those guys, but with both of them, it happened way before we expected it to happen. The same thing could be said about Porter Hodge last year, where I I think we yeah. we probably believed in him as a starting pitcher. Uh, more than we did with Palencia and Luke Little. Uh, but the conversion to relief came way sooner than we thought with Porter Hodge mm -hmm. as well. So all three of those guys, we kind of, we envision relief in their future. It happened earlier than we thought. Yep. It kind of just caught us off guard. With Arias, it's kind of the same way where you're looking at Michael Arias and you're like, okay, like I, uh, every, I, I, he was going to be a relief pitcher. Like there was no way that Michael Arias was, was going yeah, to stick I in the rotation so, in yeah. Chicago. I, I don't. I think that pretty much you, pretty much anybody you ask, they didn't. They didn't project Michael Arias to be a starting pitcher at the major right. league level. But he was just out of the forty man roster this off season. He was just converted to pitching not too awful long ago. It was. Just, it surprised me that this report came in that he's going to be a reliever now. And he's mm -hmm. going to get the bump up to, to double A Tennessee. I had him projected for the uh, rotation in South Bend to start off this year. Yep. And he's going to get the promotion up, convert it to the bullpen and see how it rides, I guess. I think it's, it caught us all off guard and it, it caught me off guard here today as we saw this, because it's not something that very recent Cubs organizations would have done. Yeah. <laughs> like, if you told me that they did one of these moves five years ago, I would be like shocked like that. There's no way that happens. They are going to milk every ounce of starter potential out of a guy yep. before they consider it to a player's detriment at times. At least that's mm -hmm. my opinion. Like with Alex Lang, oh, that was the choir, buddy, <laughs> man, that guy should have been in the pen and he would have. Yeah. We don't need to go too deep <laughs> on that. Um, but like they did not want to exhaust a, a chance that somebody could even come up to pitch a an outing 
And so now they're realizing, hey, you know what? Guys have enough, a limited number of bullets. If they're ready to fire them off, then they're ready to fire them off. And if it makes sense to do the pen, and we don't think that they're going to project as well in the rotation, then what are we waiting for? Why are we waiting for 2025 when we can do it right now and let them get used to the outing? It's, it's, it's different, man. I mean, look at Ben Brown. He was called up to start yeah. off the year. I, I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, as the game transitions into, um, there's fewer guys that are going to eight innings. There's fewer guys yeah. that are going six innings. Um, I, you get your best 13 pitchers to the major league level and let them go. Um, yep. If it's Luke Little going for an inning, if it's Michael Arias later this year going for two innings, I don't care. I don't care how many innings you are. And I think that, that the Cubs have in Craig Council a guy that can piece together a game of pitchers mm-hmm. maybe better than any other manager in all of baseball. And so yeah. you just you stock him up with 13 really good arms. You let him get out, man. And and I, I have loved it. Now, I I think the second part of this, the second part of uh, maybe not Luke Little as much, but the second part of Daniel Palencia um, and of like Porter Hodge, I think those mm-hmm. guys specifically – you're looking at those two and you're like, okay, let's not give up on him eating more innings down the road, mm-hmm. right? If if he comes up and he is really good in Chicago as a one-inning reliever is Daniel Palencia or is Porter Hodge, awesome. If you look at him and you say, you know what, I think we can get some more out of him. I think we can get five innings and him be a starter, then let's not give up on that just yet. So mm-hmm. it's not just get your best arms up. It's continue to develop those guys even once they re- reach the major leagues. Yep. And I think that like that is something I can't emphasize enough over over time that like the development does not stop in the my or once you reach the major leagues. It does it, it doesn't for anybody and especially doesn't for young pitchers. It just you continue to 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 develop and it's so so important. So I love it. I love what they're doing. I love moving Michael Arias to the bullpen. Now, I probably wouldn't have done it this quickly, but I'm going to just lean on what the Cubs development staff has decided because I believe in them. Yeah. I, I mean, I think they've they've proven that they know what they're doing. And, you know, no, they're not the Dodgers or the Rays right now, but dang, man, Justin Steele, look what he's done, right? And they debuted him just in that way. So, like... Let's just let it ride. I'm I'm excited to see this. Now, how much do you think that also is a um, a comment on like a kind of indicating how much the Cubs front office believes in the starting pitchers they have in the organization, yeah, right? Like, I, I think that you're you're doing this. You're taking Daniel Palencia and Luke Little and Porter Hodge and Michael Arias, who were at one point all at least top top 10 maybe top five pitchers in the organization starting pitchers Mm -hmm. and you're converting to the bullpen right so now you're out those guys is starting pitching prospects how much is that them like believing in the brandon birdsills and the connor nolans and the drew graves and the brody mccullough's and like the guys that are like they're still left over that starting pitching prospects how much is that the front office believing in what they can do with those guys i i mean i think if the Cubs didn't have the cadre of starting pitchers, starting pitching prospects that they do have, they probably wouldn't do this. Like maybe they do it with one guy, right? Like they yeah. just identify somebody and they say, Daniel Palencia is a reliever. Let's just do this. But they're probably letting Luke Little go, you mm-hmm. know, as a starter for a bit longer until he proves he's not they're probably letting Michael Arias, they say, Hey, you've got three option years. So like, we're just going to let those ride and, and then work your way up. That's fine. Like, you, you know, you might do that, but they have Brown and they have Horton and already those two make you feel really good. Cause they're pretty much like 2024 20, guys, right? Brown's already yeah. up. And then you've got this big group in that like high a double a level of guys that you're like, if you told me that they're up later this year or early next year, I'm not that shocked. And they just didn't have that group. I mean, yeah. first of all, they haven't had a Horton since 2002, yeah. but they definitely didn't have this other group that you've brought up. And that is huge for depth. And even so, like, even still, I think I've, it's probably on the show where I've talked about like the, even like the next tier of guys where it's like, man, if, if, 
this year in 2024, somehow Grant Kip broke out, I'd be like, mm, you know what? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I can see it. Like, I'm not expecting Grant Kip or Nick Hole to break out. But if they ended up putting together a damn good year in 2024, I'd be like, yeah, I mean, the Cubs pitching development knows how to do that. <laughs> they do. Um, Espinosa is a guy Espinosa, that, yeah. you know, like we consistently talk about. And I mean, they're just, they're just a group of guys that, hey, if something clicks, then they take that next step. That's not going to be shocking, and, and it would be awesome. There's a whole bunch of those guys. Good example is Hunter Bickey. Hunter Biggie yeah. is a really good example. Where it's like last year, you look at the numbers from Honey, Hunter Biggie last year, or the year before, it's like, eh, like, okay, Hunter yeah. Biggie. Uh, he got in spring training and he looked great. And you're like, okay, maybe he's the first guy called up out of the bullpen. <laughs> Who knows? Like, he could make an impact in Chicago this year. I know he's, 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 um, working his way back from an injury. It sounds like he started the year in Iowa on the, on the injured list. But like, that's a good example where it's like, he just came out in spring training. It's like all of a sudden now he's a, a major league quality reliever. And like, that came out of nowhere. So, uh, yeah, that just goes to show how much I believe in them. Um, let's go ahead and transition here. We did ask yeah. for listener questions on um, on social media, and we got plenty of good uh, responses, but qu- questions back. We're going to pick a couple of them here that I think kind of pertain to this episode and this show. Uh, we got a question. Oh, I didn't write down who these were from. Um, I am so sorry, folks. Uh, we're going to go ahead and <laughs> ask the question. And thank you guys all so much for sending this, these in. These were all terrific. I know Don sent in some questions. That was terrific. He's always on, on top of it. Um, I know Steven sent in a question. A few others sent in questions. So thank you guys so much. Uh, this question is about kind of the organization as a whole. It's coming off of our, our month of, of season previews of each mm-hmm. of the affiliates. We're sitting here today and we only know the Iowa Cubs roster. We still don't know Tennessee, South Bend, or Myrtle Beach. Um, but something we didn't really talk about was the organization as a whole and the position groups. So this question is now that the rosters are be- beginning to be finalized, what are the roster str- strengths and weaknesses at each affiliate? So I think the the way that I want to approach this one, and if you yeah. see it going a different direction, let me know. Um, but just, I guess, point out p- position groups or mm-hmm. whether it's starters or outfielders or whatever that really stand out at the affiliates. Um, and I think, the first place we can go in terms of a strength is the outfield in Iowa. We're already seeing him take the field, right? So yep. um, that outfield of <laughs> Owen Casey, of Alexander Canario, um, and then of who have, and, and Pete Carl Armstrong, I guess th- th- that mm-hmm. three, um, not even including some of the guys off the bench, like those three, that's, that's about as, that's as good as it gets in the system, I think. And, and Brennan will be there and mm-hmm. we've got a report out today that they, um, that I think I think it was it Tommy Birch that talked to Jason Kanzler. Yes. Yes. Okay. So Tommy Birch, great, obviously connected uh, to the Iowa Cubs and Des Moines in general, of course. Um, and so, and Jason Kanzler is the new director of player development for the Cubs, and he mentioned that Brennan is not that far off. So I mean, we are talking about adding Brennan, who knock on wood has been kind of looking pretty decent mm-hmm. if he can stay healthy um, to PCA to Owen Casey and to Alexander Canario. Yeah, I mean, we don't need to dive too deep into it, but the Iowa outfield is insane. I think that's the best position group in the entire organization. And yeah, that's, and that's so. you even got, I mean, if we're going to keep on the on the hitting side of things, the Tennessee hitters as a whole, like as an entire group, is really strong. If we can focus in on the, the Tennessee infield specifically, yes. I mean, that's really good too, where you got, assuming... Say, say you put Moises Ballesteros at first base. Well, I don't know. Say you put Moises I mean, you at first catcher, base. You can say catcher, you know. And you can put him at catcher. But infield. I want to include it's Pablo fun. Aliendo, right? So if you can put Pablo at, at catcher, you got Moises at first. <laughs> yep. You got Triantos at second. You got Matt Shaw at third. Um, let's put Josh Rivera at shortstop. And then Hayden yeah. McGeary DHing. That that infield group is tremendous That's as well. That's man. That's like legitimate prospects at each one, which, I mean, I never – I don't want to be that person to be like, if you're not a prospect, like I don't really pay attention to you because you never know about bre- breakouts happen. That breakouts absolutely happen. And what is a prospect is super variable. We don't need to get into that. But the whole point is that like the depth in this system is pretty crazy. So yeah, Iowa outfield, Tennessee infield is just like, it's must watch, but you could say that about like <laughs> pretty much all the f- four affiliates is nuts. Yeah. Any on the other end of the spectrum, anything that stands out as a weaker <clears throat> position group at an affiliate? So it's too bad, and it's not really their fault or anything, but the Iowa 
starting pitching staff is not great. And part of that is because the Cubs have had issues at the major league level. And so you immediately take Ben Brown out of that. Um, you lose Jamison Tyone. And so then Javier Saad could have been potentially pitching and he wouldn't have necessarily been a prospect, but he's still a really good starting pitching option. And Cade Horton could have absolutely been justified to start a trip away, but it sounds like they're slow playing him. So, you know, a confluence of factors all in the starting pitching is not devoid of talent, but it's not a high interest. Well, it's a weird situation, right? So you you got in the Iowa rotation, you got Hayden Wesneski is kind of like leading the charge there as a name, but like in Chicago, is he a, is he a starter or is he a reliever? Um, You got Thomas, Thomas Pannone, who is like, Mm -hmm. that is, your veteran uh, yep. presence in that rotation. But the other guys are like, okay, uh, you got Riley Thompson and Chris catch or uh, Riley Thompson and Chris Clark. And actually right. now Chris Cashmar was just promoted up there. Oh, those yeah, are all three right. guys. Where it's like, I want to see all three of those guys as one inning relievers in Iowa. I, I don't want to see them and start. Like, I think that yeah. they can be something if they are locked into a one inning reliever role. But mm-hmm. unfortunately, because of the depth, they have to be, and their familiarity with being a starting pitcher, they're having to be starters. Obviously, we've seen Riley Thompson work out of the bullpen, which I think was really – that actually impressed me, and I was really happy to see Riley Thompson as a reliever this past weekend. Yep. I want to continue to see him work as a reliever um, and see what he does there. But, like, Chris Clark as a, as a starting pitcher was like, I want to see him as a reliever, man. I want to see him as a reliever. Yeah. Um, and then even Walker Powell. We'll see Walker Powell on the mound on Tuesday um, for the uh, opener at Principal Park in Iowa. Um, that's another guy to kind of keep an eye on for sure. But it's just a, it's a weird grouping of of players in Iowa rotation. Yeah. And then we don't really know what the lower minors are going to necessarily yeah. look like because there could be a triple trickle-down effect. I'm intrigued. I wouldn't say it's a huge strength, but I'm intrigued what the South Bend infield looks like because you do have Jefferson Rojas. It sounds like Ed Howard is probably going to be playing a little bit more second base. Um you know, we they do have some other talented guys down there. Christian Hernandez probably is a guy that's in Myrtle Beach, but mm-hmm. what if he locks it in and goes off? Uh, and, you know, Alex Hernandez, same kind of thing. So there are some interesting players down there. Again, I wouldn't say like super strength, but, but definitely intriguing position groups. Uh, I want to cover one more here yep. as kind of a question mark one before we move on um, to the mm-hmm. kind of draft segment of this episode. But the Myrtle Beach rotation, <laughs> I talked about it with Sam on, on the show here. I, it, it, it sounds like there's, they're going to go by uh, the quantity approach. Um, mm-hmm. Not necessarily not quality, just like definitely quantity. But I think I think it's going to be piggyback central, right? Yeah. I, I think that there will not be a single pitcher. My prediction is that to start off the year for the first, I'd say give me through the end of May, I don't think a pitcher goes more than four innings. Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> I, I they're going to have they're going to have a whole they're going to have 10 dudes yeah. that can go multiple innings but not necessarily like five mm-hmm. strong. I will say I'm not a betting person really. Yeah. I will say that through the month of May they have two pitchers at least get into the 5th inning. Okay. You That's about it, though. I mean, really, like, <laughs> yeah. I really don't think it's going to happen very and, often. And it's it's going to be ha- it's going to have to come because he's like hitters are jumping on the first pitch and he has a yeah. super low pitch count. It's yeah, like it, a it, pitch count of sixty or something. Yeah, and you're like, whatever, let him weird. start the fifth. Yeah, but I mean, like the entire like the entire roster, and and there's only going to be a few pitchers there that are throwing mm-hmm. one inning outings, right? I think it's going to be there's going to be fourteen guys there. I think or fourteen, fifteen guys there. I think it'll be that, 15, that can throw yeah. fifteen. And ten or eleven, ten or eleven of them will be piggyback, piggyback. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it'll be a bad. I, I really don't. I don't know. I can't say if it's going to be a bad rotation or a bad pitching staff or not, because one, I, I'll admit that I don't know enough about a lot of these dudes. Um, mm-hmm. Two, they're going to be used in roles that we have yet to see them pitch in. Mm-hmm. Um, and three, maybe they thrive off this piggyback action. So we just we can't say for sure how good. The Myrtle Beach rotate or the Myrtle Beach pitching staff is going to be, um, but it's going to be worth watching. It's going to be worth keeping an eye on. And honestly, like you and I going through and distinguishing like who seems legit, who doesn't, is going to be really difficult for us to do. <laughs> yeah, it's not really going to be a fun task. <laughs> so. yeah. 
All right, man. We got uh, we got one more listener question. You want to dig in yeah. a listener question first, or your mock draft stuff first? Uh, let's do a listener question. All right, the listener question. Um, I'm pretty sure this one was from Don. I'm pretty sure it was uh, asking, saying, "I was so happy that Dan Kantrovitz didn't leave the organization last season because there were plenty of rumors that he were that he was going to." Um, he's a big, big believer in drafting the best player available, but is there a player in this draft that you, Greg Zumak, would draft to fill a perceived hole in the system? Yeah, that's a really interesting one, Dan. I, I really appreciate the question. And, and yeah, I, I think, you know, you, the Cubs, they would have had quite the talent drain if they lost Breslow and Kantrovitz in one off season, right? Like, you know, these kind of things do happen in baseball, but it's nice if you can keep the guys for a few years if you're having some success. So yeah, I mean, Kantrovitz has, has proven that they've drafted best player available. And it sounds like Don's also a big believer in drafting best player available. So, you know, a perceived hole in the system is interesting because we just talked about how deep the system is, but you know, I'm going to throw, man, it's a really good question. I am going to throw an interesting one out there, which we just talked about how good the starting pitching is in this organization. And yet, I think if you were to not necessarily draft Bless Pair available, but truly try to fill a hole, I think another advanced starter would be who I would target. And yes, you've got Ben Brown, and yes, you've got Kate Horton, and yes, you've got a whole bunch of cadre of pitchers, you know, coming up behind them and 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 stuff. But if you could tell me that you could identify a guy like Trey Savage, who's one of, I'm a huge fan of Trey Savage, and I'll talk about him in a second. But if you feel like he could be kind of on that caliber, not Horton caliber, but like Brown caliber of somebody that could be up in the majors in a couple years, an advanced arm that you felt like this is a starting pitcher. This is a starting pitcher that we feel like can have multiple plus pitches. This is a, I don't like, you know, two, three, four, whatever. This is a playoff caliber starter. And not just a guy that we're he could shift to the pen and he'd be pretty good. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, a thing that an organization should always try to take, um, or at least consider taking. And I think Trey Savage out of East Carolina with the high rise, high carry fastball, a very unique arm angle. Um, he's kind of a bulldog out there, which the Cubs love. Uh, and he's got this slider and splitter combination with two of his his pitches i mean he he l looks like he could have three plus pitches if he happens to be sitting on the board and i happen to love his curveball i actually think his curveball might even be his best pitch for whatever reason he's not throwing it very much that's the kind of guy i would at least take a chance on yeah so yeah so you you, you released your mock draft mm -hmm. your first it was your first mock draft um over at north side bound of the 2024 draft uh, that was released last week. You guys can go out, go there and check it out. I might, I'll try to throw it into the, uh, into the uh, bio or into the the description of this of this podcast episode. Mm -hmm. um, and you did have uh, Trey, uh, you, is it you Savage? Is that how you pronounce Savage, it? Savage, oh which is, God, I mean, the obvious shirt sell themselves. Oh so, yeah, like yeah. you don't even need to worry about right, that. So you had Trey Savage at number thirteen from ECU. He's a right-handed pitcher. Um, he, he he just seems like a guy that is a Cubs type of pitcher Cubs prospect type of pitcher like what the Cubs are trying to work with now with you mentioned the the, the writing fastball the slider and then now the the, the split finger changeup which is something that that uh, uh, players are kind of going to now so uh, that all lines up as a as a Cubs type of pick do you think that what's what's the likelihood that he's available there for the Cubs at 13 it's a really interesting question because so I add 14 um, but uh, yeah, they picked 13 last year. They, yeah. they just love to stay in the same zone. Apparently we got to be having them picked like 28, 29. How about yeah. that for next year? <laughs> and so, um, but at 12 is Boston. And I don't know how involved Craig Breslow will be as president of baseball operations. There's a really compelling case for either side. He could be like really hands-on, right? Like he is the ultimate decision maker. He should be very involved in the pick. Or it could be the complete opposite, which is he's not seeing the guys as much as his amateur scouting staff is. So trust the people that you that you have in the roles. Truly don't know. And so, but I could see Yasavage highly intriguing somebody like Craig Breslow. Yasavage is really good, and he is certainly an option in that probably middle range. 
Um, I think it, there is a decent chance that he is there with because not every team trusts going with pitching high uh, because there is some risk to that. And like going 1-1 with a pitcher, pretty risky. 1-1 is in the first pick of the draft. Going in the top five pitching, there are some evaluators who believe that you shouldn't ever take a pitcher in the top five. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like that could, we don't know how teams individually feel on that. And you've got Chase Burns out of Wake Forest and Hagen Smith who look like top five overall picks, but it depends on how teams are going to view that. And it's actually shaping up to be a really interesting top of the draft. And so, especially with the Savage being a pitcher, he could happen to be sitting there at 14 and that wouldn't shock me. So say you Savage is off the board, come come pick number 14. I know you hinted at a few other guys that might be potential options mm-hmm. for the Cubs at that 14th overall pick. You threw out the names of Carter Johnson and Ty Lewis um, and Cam Smith, three guys um, that might be other options. Uh, what's the what's the details? What's the information on those three guys? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'll, I'll just say really quickly, I, I'm a big fan of Ty Lewis uh, in the Nebraska area. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but like I and, and I, I might be just kind of high on him, um, but he just really athletic shortstop. I, I like what he does in the field, and, and I think that he's a guy that probably goes higher than where he's ranked. I, I think, you know, that's kind of the caliber. Is it middle of the first round? I don't know about that, but but he's just the kind of guy that I would I would follow. Carter Johnson is somebody who plays is um, down south, and so a little bit more advanced competition. Uh, he's been on the radar for teams for a while. He kind of fits that. It's it's not the same profile, but it's not that dissimilar from somebody like Cole Emerson, who I was a huge fan of Cole Emerson last year. That was the guy that Matt Shaw's been great. This is not a Matt Shaw diss in the slightest. I sat there on on draft day and said, if they have a chance to draft Cold Emerson, they should draft Cold Emerson. Um, and both Shaw and Emerson have looked really good. So, you know, it, it's fine. That's the kind of profile from Carter Johnson that you can see a little bit of a hit over power, shortstop, but maybe ends up at second base, prep, faced against advanced competition for high schoolers, done really well. And so, you know, that's a guy to, to kind of pay attention to. Cam Smith is the one thing for my mock that I consistently got feedback on after it was released that it really would have been helpful before it was released, which is you're way too low on Cam Smith where he ended up getting drafted in the mock, which is like 28th to the Astros. Um, People are like, I don't think that's going to happen. I think he's going to go much higher. And so probably potentially in right around where that Cubs range is. Cam Smith is a really good third baseman. And if you looked at him last year, you would probably say he's not quite a first rounder. He made tremendous improvements on the Cape Cod League, which is a wood bad league. Good swing decisions, improved contact, decreased chase. He's carried all that over. He's kept power into the season, and he looks like a guy that should go in the top 15 picks. And so, you know, I clearly was just wrong on that, creating the mock, which is good, and that's where the fun of it is. Uh, to immediately get that feedback, but that's a guy that in that Cubs range, yeah, Cam Smith. Cam Smith would be really fun. Um, fun. So I, I am, I'm not a guy that follows the draft. And like you're, you're our resident draft guy. Um, I keep up with what I see on Twitter. I follow college baseball, but I'm not the draft guy in the same way that you are. And I'm looking at some of the names that are that you have mocked. Um, ahead of the Cubs, that they're yeah. going to be drafted before the Cubs, um, and not even guys that are one, two, and three um, in the mock mm-hmm. draft, but guys that are lower, lower down. You mentioned Hagen Smith, but yep. they're guys that are famous names and famous to the point where I recognize them and I know what they're about, even without being a draft guy. It's the Hagen Smith, it's Jack Caglione, yeah, it Jack is Clyde. JJ Weatherholt, yep. um, it is Seaver King. Even I, I recognize mm-hmm. that name. Vance Vance Honeycutt has been on mm-hmm. the scene since he was a freshman in North Carolina. Um, there's guys that are recognizable names to me. Are there any chance that the Jack Caglione's or the, or the, uh, the guys like that? I, I know that you have, have even further down the, uh, the kid from, from Iowa, the starting pitcher from Iowa that Brady can't Brecht. find his own Brody yep. Brecht that can't find his own this year. 
Right. Um, what's the likelihood that the Cubs can pull the trigger on a quote unquote famous name? Oh, I mean, decent. Cause this class actually has a good amount of them. Like you mentioned, I mean, Braid Montgomery is another probably famous name and the feedback that we've heard, like myself, a few of the draft folks and scouts and stuff have kind of heard that he likely won't be there. Um, he's probably closer to a one, one or one, two option than he is a one fourteen option. But, um, but you know, another famous name, but the whole point is that if you keep adding names to the top, they all filter down, right? Like, yeah. So Jack Cags is a really interesting dude because he what he shows you in raw ability is like crazy. I mean, people can't really do what he does, both on the mound. He's not like a stellar pitcher, but he will show you impressive tools on the mound. And then what he can do at the plate, he has a one of the batted ball metrics is, is chase rate, the, how often you swing outside the zone. And there are teams that feel differently on how important chase rate is because in many ways it's like we can teach you what is a strike and, and a ball it's the ability to make contact with power and if you do it a foot out of the zone and you still hit a home run then who are we to say that that's a bad swing decision right and he has done that it wasn't a foot out of the zone but he hit one that was like way down there and he hit it out of the field and it was just nuts so the whole point is like chase rate maybe doesn't matter to some organizations as much, but it's really high. Like it's about 40%. And that's not great. When Matt Shaw was drafted, we looked at Matt Shaw's chase rate and it was like, yeah, that's kind of a little high. And it was 26. <laughs> um, so Jack Cags is sitting at 40, eh, something to watch there. So I, I know that the, with Shohei Otani taking over the, the Major League Baseball landscape, the two-way player, you look at Jack Caglione, it's like, oh, he's the, the Otani of college baseball right now. Um, how, do you, how do you compare like Jack Caglione as a Major League Baseball prospect um, and his ability yeah. to be a two-way player with a guy like Brendan McKay, who a few years ago was like, oh, he's the, the next two-way player. Mm -hmm. And obviously his, his career hasn't panned out in that way, but like he was also a top 10 draft pick. I think um, he went what, second. Five, yeah, what, yeah, five years ago, six years ago mm -hmm. now? I guess more than that maybe. But um, how do you compare Caglione to a guy like Brendan McKay, who was drafted by the Rays? Yeah, I, I'm still kind of surprised Brendan McKay went second. Uh, and if I got that right, because it's been a few years, but I, I think he was right about there. Um, Jack Cax is a better player. Like, he'll show you better raw tools on both sides of the ball. I mean, Brendan McKay was, like, an interesting starting pitching prospect, but then kind of a tweener for the first baseman, and then he got injured, and then that just, the whole thing spiraled, unfortunately. Um, but Jack Cags, you could take either side of the coin out of it, you know, either pitching or hitting out of it, and he's probably still a first-rounder. Yeah. Um, the ability to hit 100 from the left-hand side is something that doesn't really grow on trees. And while there's a lot of ironing out, it wouldn't be surprising to see a team say like, you know what, we're just going to take the raw tools. We don't need this anytime soon. We're just going to let him work and force his way. And he will tell us if it's in the field or at the plate on the mound or both. Um, and there's some teams up there that, that certainly love tools. So it could be fun. Yeah. I, I'm excited. I, I think that this is actually a draft that I am I'm more excited uh, about than past years just because of mm -hmm. those famous names, because of the guys like Jack Cags that um, has been, I, I think between, there's, there's been like 12 different dudes that have been projected as the number one overall pick. Um, yeah, and you got Caglione, then, and Brody Brecht was projected as the number one pick for a little bit, and he's, I don't even know where you had him in the dra in the, in the mock draft. 24th. But 24, yeah. With Lane. So, um, it's just kind of, it's, it's weird. This is a weird draft and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So, yeah, I, I will say like one thing with the draft, cause it, the question we get every year and no one really knows until it all happens, but basically like, is the, is this draft a great year? Was last, is it better than last year's? And like, the, that's the really interesting thing about this class because last year was historic because of like a whole bunch of factors with the COVID season, a whole bunch of high mm -hmm. schoolers ended up going to college and then they were amazing. Yeah. Um, they normally would have gotten drafted and, and signed. And and so like, last year was kind of historic, but also like this, so we're kind of looking down on this draft a little bit like, hey, it's not going to be that. The more time that we've spent watching these players, 
the top, you know, 15 to 20 players, like these are guys are really good. Like Seaver yeah. King could fall to 17 or he could go seven or eight. And I would look at it and be like, yeah, that's totally cool. So it's just, it's a fun group. Like you said. Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. I think that's it. We we've uh, hit our hour mark. We've covered a lot yep. of topics. We're in store for a fun, a fun, fun week of minor league baseball. We got a full week of Iowa Cubs action. Uh, they'll be taking the field Tuesday. Probably uh, you guys might be listening to this and they might already be on the field. Uh, they are facing off um, in, in Iowa. They'll, they'll be in Des Moines this week, full, full week of action. The other affiliates are back in action too. All three of Tennessee Smokies, the South Bend Cubs and the Myrtle beach Pelicans will all be taking the field starting on Friday and they'll have a weekend of action uh, for those three teams. So when we come back to you guys next week, uh, we'll have plenty of minor league prospect action to talk about. Greg, do you want to talk about uh, where people can find you and where they, they can talk some minor league baseball? Yeah. I mean, definitely find me on Twitter X, whatever we're calling it these days at Ivy futures. You can find me on the 1060 West uh, discord we talk some great baseball it's mostly cubs related but sometimes it, it shifts into like cubs prospects and and um you know mlb hot stove and stuff like that uh if you ever want an invite just shoot me a, a message on on twitter uh usually that's the best way to do it but that's yeah it's just that's generally where i spend most of my time and then of yeah, course the i write it north side bound with you the 1060 West Discord has been terrific. I, I, I've really enjoyed that as the games have been in action, following the prospect action. So that's been fun. Check that out. Uh, if you guys are watching on YouTube, hit the like button below. Comment if you if you want to. We really appreciate the the subscriptions and the likes. That goes a long, long way. Um, we've appreciated your support all throughout the off season. We're excited to continue talking to you guys all throughout the regular season now that it's happening. Uh, you can find us anywhere where you find your podcast. You can find me on Twitter at out of the vines. You can find uh, us on Instagram Cubs on deck um, on threads on Twitter, on discord, on all that good stuff. Uh, go check us out. Can't thank you guys enough for tuning for always tuning in and we'll be back in your ears in one short week. Thanks guys.